Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Seattle experience uh, in terms of uh, these uh, buildings that uh, utilize performance-based design. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the background in history, uh, the process that <coughs> we have in place for these type of projects, and some of the technical issues that we've been dealing with on some of these projects. Um, first peer review project in Seattle was back in 1999, so we've been doing it for 15 years now. Uh, there's over 30 projects um, that we've peer reviewed, and I have here on the slide seven, it's actually nine projects currently under review. Uh, we're, we're really seeing a lot of this currently, um, and there's an additional seven that are under construction. Uh, projects, wide range of projects, residential office, hotel, uh, it kind of morphs with uh, the economy. Uh, some projects uh, have multiple structures on the site, and that's presented some unique issues, particularly as those uh, transfer diaphragms and how they're analyzed. <coughs> uh, most projects are concrete cores, but some have con contained BRBs, significant transfer elements, seismic joints. So we've, we've seen uh, some that are fairly straightforward, just a straight core, and others that are fairly complex. Um, just some example projects here. The first one uh, was built as Washington Mutual Seattle Art Museum Tower. It's now Russell Investment. Um, but the museum actually, which is the small building on the bottom, uh, the south of that, uh, <coughs> extends into and underneath the office tower. So there's large transfer elements. Um, it's actually connected to the museum in one direction only. There's a very large shear well that runs in the east-west direction, so it had to be disconnected, and yet it was connected in the other direction. So that's an example of a complex peer-reviewed project. Um, Olive 8 Hotel in Seattle was a little more straightforward. It's, um, I believe it's residential and hotel. Uh, right now under construction is this uh, Fifth and Columbia. They're just digging a hole now. It's got some mega braces on the perimeter and a core. Uh, it's got an extremely tall first story. Uh, so that was another one that had some interesting design elements to it. 800 Stewart Street, an office tower. And 815 Pine Street, it, which topped off this summer and I believe is going to be getting initial occupancy in the next couple months here. <coughs> so now on to process. Um, so one thing that's really important is the initial notification of a proposed peer review project. If you think you have one of these projects and you're going to start it next year, call us. Let us know that. We, we have peer review teams. We have staff who manage the individual projects. We like to know as soon as possible what's, what's on the calendar. Um, submittal of documents. And I'm, I'm going to skip to the last bullet, which is a kickoff meeting. So that's a really important meeting. It's a meet and greet and go over the basis of design, and I'll talk a little bit more about that too. But approximately a month before that, or even more, uh, we're looking for a submittal from the engineer who's proposing this type of work. Um, it's a formal request for a peer review, so that we mark it on the calendar and uh, establish a proposed kickoff time frame. We want schematic drawings, we want a draft structural basis of design, and a draft geotechnical basis of design. And the purpose of that is, first of all, when we get that, we, depending on what we're seeing, we will select a peer review team, that, that's something the city does, and we'll send that to them for, to see about their availability and such, and then scheduling a meeting. And that takes time. You can imagine the, the design team, the peer review team, the city team, to get it scheduled takes a while. So <clears throat> probably a month before, if not more, uh, before you really want to formally start the process. So again, that kickoff meeting is really important, and s same with the basis of design document, because again, it's a, a meet and greet, but by that time, the peer reviewer has had, had an opportunity to look at what you've got, how complex it is, is there transfer elements, is there BRBs, how tall is it, all that sort of thing, are the columns, um, um, diagonal columns that have special um, requirements. And then they look at that basis of design. And the basis of design, that's that first round that happens in a peer review process. 
is an agreement on what the criteria is, what those acceptance criteria, kind of the rules of the road so that the engineer is not marching down, designing a building, and then finding out he's got a major problem. We like to see this almost at the schematics because the earlier it happens, the more ability to change something. If the peer reviewer says this is going to be a problem, there, there might be a chance of changing it. If it's too far along, then it's going to have to be a design solution to figure out something to work around. So um, <clears throat> the basis of design is in the city is typically based on the, the TBI document, um, but we, we don't require that. We require that the basis of design be clear enough that the peer reviewer can look at it and agree that this is, this is the, the plan, this is the, the rule book for this project. One thing to keep in mind is, although we like to have that initial process of, of refining the basis of design so that the design can move forward following that, it's somewhat of a living document. We have found that as projects move forward that sometimes things change, discoveries are made, and that basis of design gets tweaked. So it's, it's to help plan so that pri primarily the design team can move forward with their design knowing what is expected, but sometimes things come up, so just be aware of that. Um, currently, also, um, the uh, TBI is, uh, requires um, service level and an MCE level. Uh, for Seattle, we require that, <coughs> I'm sorry, I got my throat's a little rough here, but um, that it also be uh, code compliant. Code compliant as nearly as possible. We know there's exceptions. Right off the bat, it's, there's a height limit exception. But we, we really like to see, again, in the basis of design, define what, what exceptions are going to occur and what enhancements. One of the enhancements, of course, is the nonlinear analysis. But um, so we do require the DBE and the MCE verification. Uh, structural basis of design includes, and, and, and Jack put up a slide there, which is great, um, but basic building information, um, your design approach, exceptions, enhancements. Um, sometimes, as we've done this a long time, there may be a new ACI code. In fact, ACI 318.14 just got pushed out. So an in, a design team may say, well, we want to use something from that document. Um, so and it, sometimes it's an exception, sometimes it's an enhancement. Um, material properties, software program used for analysis and design. Uh, a really important one is the acceptance criteria for both the DBE and the MCE. Uh, stiffness property assumptions. Uh, there, there's a whole list. This, this has a few. The, the slide that was up earlier had more. Um, and then this, you probably can't read. And this, yeah, well, hmm. Apparently some of it cut off. Um, but the important part about this slide is it's the process and timing that we typically see in a peer review, peer review that occurs in Seattle. Um, the left column is the peer review milestones, and those milestones typically are the basis of design. And when I say basis of design, there's a geotechnical basis of design and a structural basis of design. So there's kind of a process, a little bit of correction cycle to get that agreed to. Then there's this DB SLE design that has a review process, correction comments from the peer reviewer, response from the engineer of record, and then perhaps another round, and then the MCE verification analysis. Um, in some ways you could argue that maybe a month for the basis of design, a couple months for the um, code design and then three, four months for the MCE, that's at seven months or whatever. The reality is in Seattle, it's you count on maybe nine to 12 months. The, the reality is also that the, there's architects involved, there's developer involved, changes can occur, and quite frankly, sometimes it's just, whether it's the engineer of record or the peer reviewer, raises an issue that requires a little bit of a side study. And that, that can take time, so it, it it does take some time to get these reviewed. Um, we also, the second column, and the reason I have this slide up here is, um, is to kind of 
demonstrate how we work it all together. The second uh, column is about permitting. The third column is about construction. And ideally, from a jurisdiction's point of view, you do a peer review and have it complete. You do your design and get your permit, and then construction starts. And of course, that doesn't work. Timing, developers, that, that they'd go wild. So we, we've tried as much as possible to overlap those elements. Uh, in fact, I think we tried a little too hard, and then we had some emergencies trying to get uh, projects going at started construction at the right time. So we pulled back a little on that. I, the key piece here is if you have one of these projects, call us early. We'll be happy to go over this with you. It'll help you because when you come into that kickoff meeting, you should have some idea of what your desire is, your proposed schedule. And if you, if, if you have an opportunity to chat with us, we can probably help you craft something that is reasonably realistic. Um, I don't know, how am I doing here? How much time do I have? You have uh, five minutes. Okay. So peer review <coughs> team makeup. We in Seattle we typically have a structural engineer lead, geotechnical engineer expert, and an academic. We don't always have the academic. We have had some on uh, some projects. I think when it's most opportune is projects that are somewhat unique and they need some specialized expertise. Uh, that's occurred frequently in the past and, and we really um, think that's a great, good idea. Um, reporting structure, the peer review team works for the city. So in fact, we're in a process right now of expanding our peer review teams that we contract with. Um, and then <clears throat> when as we get billed, we pass that on to the developer. So the, the team, we've, we felt it was really important that the peer reviewer works for the jurisdiction and not for the the developer or the design team. Okay, um, some technical issues of note, and, and this is partly, I, I felt like it's an opportunity here. There's a lot of experts and a lot of the code writers in this room. <laughs> so um, issues that have come up that, how should I say this, before the TBI, there were a variety of issues, and a lot of experts got together to write this document, and I say TBI, but there's the LA TB um, a document also in the San Francisco document, but um, um, they got together, they came to some, developed some guidelines that I think are well received, most of the engineers are using it. Um, but that was four years ago and things have changed. Um, so a couple items is the stiffness properties of elements. I think uh, John mentioned in his presentation how in San Francisco they have requirements that um, may or may not be um, agreed on by the whole community. Um, what it, then capacity-based design, the TBI is kind of capacity-based design, and um, if you saw some of the core walls that were presented earlier, they have a lot of link beams in some of the walls, but the perpendicular walls, sometimes there's nothing, it's just a pure shear wall. And so there's, I've heard discussions about, then you only have one hinge. You only have one concentrated area of ductility. And is that a good thing? And so I've heard distributing that inelasticity up the tower somewhat. So that's, that's something that um, should be considered and looked at perhaps. Uh, setbacks is part of that issue. Design of transfer diaphragms, um, that also was mentioned earlier, I think also John that those diaphragms, uh, first of all, they're carved up. Uh, there could be ramps down to the parking below. Uh, there's the loading dock. There's all these penetrations. And there's this huge trans uh, transfer that occurs at that level. And in fact, in Seattle, the question is, what is that level? You have these sloping sites. So we've, we've seen it where they've essentially um, separated the upper diaphragm from the uh, adjacent uh, basement wall, if you will. But still, that whole, there's lots of questions that occur regarding those diaphragms. And in particular, we've seen a lot of buildings recently where they have multiple structures on top of a single common podium. Sometimes a, a low rise, 100 feet or more, and a 400 foot tower. So that also presents some 
um, challenges in terms of how to design that diaphragm. Um, ground motions. Uh, I, I, I think um, the structural side is ahead of the ground motion side. Um, this uh, VS30 issue, um, where is the ground motion input? Um, and then currently we're, with these performance-based designs, we're using the NGA West 2 versus NGA West 1. Some of the results have created some uh, interesting issues. Uh, minimum base shear is one of them. Um, well, let's see, what else do I have? Oh, um, so then scaled versus match versus conditional mean. I'm really happy to hear, John, your comments that it may get into um, ASC 716. Yeah, you're welcome, Ron. <laughs> That's excellent. We, we have two major types of fault scenarios in the city. We have the Seattle fault, and we have the subduction Cascadia event. And it, it seems to um, be ideal to perhaps entertain a CMS approach for one of these projects. Um, and then code-based shear wall designs are not adequate. I just put that in because I keep hearing these performance-based design projects that if, if they did a, a non-performance-based design, it simply wouldn't work in shear. And I keep questioning Ron and actually, I think all the good guys, Ron and John and Jack and, um, and Andy are all key players in code development. So why is that? It's his fault. Okay, it's his fault. Um, <laughs> you, you guys could chat after. <laughs> so uh, recently we had uh, building height issues. How do you measure the height? Because that 240 is magic. And so we're, we're putting out a code solution. Those in the room should be aware of that kind of defines how we will interpret height so that you can be consistent in when you need performance-based design or not. Um, and finally, fee um, <coughs> has come into question of late. How much money? No, no. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Lots. Um, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, th those are just some comments of issues that we've, we've been aware of. Uh, conclusion is that uh, contact the city early in the process. That is the key. Communication is another key. And then performance-based design works. And the last slide just has some contact information. Thank you.